Theology matters. Uh, a flawed understanding of God or his word uh, can in some cases seem like a relatively small thing at its outset, but much like a ship that begins an inch off course, by the time it gets to its destination, it could be many, many miles off course. It could be way uh, off track in the long run. And so theology matters, even in its small points. And while all of us uh, who teach the Word uh, have to confess that we're always learning, I mean, none of us has a full understanding of everything in the Word of God, um, we're all learning. We're all applying ourselves to rightly divide the Word of Truth, and we might be workers that are approved of the Lord, and that's our desire. Um, but that said, uh, we do believe that if the scriptures are in fact the Word of God, and if we do believe that as such they become the rule for our faith and practice, if they become the foundation upon which we build our understanding of who God is and what His purposes are, and if we are committed to the truth of God as He's revealed it to us, then theology matters by definition. It, it makes a difference to us. And so uh, with that in mind, I want to talk about something today that um, uh, that is, is really uh, not a new thing per se, but in some form or another it's been around for a while, but it's definitely picked up steam in the body of Christ. And this is the idea of kingdom dominion theology. The idea that, uh, that somehow the church's job is to establish, uh, uh, to set up Jesus' kingdom, as it were, uh, so that he can then come and return once we've done this. And uh, this is a uh, kind of a dangerous theology in some ways. I'm not saying you can't be a believer and hold this view, but I think if you consider the view and you hold it up in the light of Scripture, uh, it becomes the kind of thing that ought to be avoided. We recognize it as something that is not line up scripturally speaking. And some of the movements connected with it, some of the uh, um, extensions, that, it's not maybe a direct extension of it, but groups that, uh, that tend to connect with it um, in, in some interesting ways, uh, also find themselves being kind of off base in, in some pretty important ways. So I want to take a minute to talk about this today a little bit, uh, especially in light of the scripture. And in particular, we're going to eventually, uh, well, eventually, sometime soon, we're going to get over to, to uh, Daniel chapter 2. So if you want to kind of put your thumb in there, uh, we'll get there in a moment. But I want to just talk just really briefly about this idea of, of kingdom dominion theology or, uh, or uh, a version of it called kingdom now. Uh, it's sometimes also called Christian Reconstructionism. And the basic idea is this. It speaks of the idea, again, that the church's job is to uh, reconstruct society based on uh, scriptural law, in particular Mosaic law, uh, most frequently. Uh, and the idea that we do this by electing Christians to office, that we put uh, Christians in places of influence, so that we can essentially Christianize the culture uh, in such a way where the, the law of God is being obeyed and is going to be lived out in society. The, the current laws of society are, are reworked in order to line up specifically with God's law as it's written in the scripture. Um, and, uh, and, and this kind of a thing. And, and I'm, I'm being somewhat general and somewhat simple in my definition of it because information about this movement is extremely easy to find online. There's no, uh, it's not like it's secret. You gotta go dig into some secret treasure trove somewhere. You can very quickly look up Kingdom Dominion Theology and find out a lot of the very specific elements of their theology, who some of the founding people are, who some of the big proponents of it are, of it are what denominations within Christianity tend to embrace it, and those kinds of things. Those are easy to find. And uh, my intention here today is in sort of a brief, but again, as always, hopefully meaningful way, speak to something biblical uh, that can help us uh, to understand, uh, um, you know, how these things measure up in the light of God's Word. And ultimately, this falls under the idea of discipleship, the idea of helping us to learn to walk with Jesus in a knowing way, in a way that best reflects and brings Him glory. Uh, and the way we do that is by walking according to what God has said. And so the idea here again of Kingdom Dominion Theology is sort of, sort of um, uh, putting forth as our topic today, uh, not only involves the idea of, of Christians becoming people of influence in culture and society, whether it's president or uh, governors and things like this, lawmakers, um, but until we, the thinking goes, that until we establish a society that is ultimately under the auspices of the Mosaic Law or under Biblical Law uh, and is run the way that um, 
you know, that is, is, might be described in Scripture, like what God's society with the Jews looked like or was supposed to look like. Until we do this, Jesus won't come back, but he will come back once we accomplish these things. And so there's a very strong uh, political drive uh, to this movement. Uh, there have been um, kind of well-known Christian leaders that have, over the years, run for president and, and have, um, you know, with that mindset, by the way. It's like it wasn't like they just thought it would be nice to have a Christian in the White House. No, there was an agenda there to become president and ultimately try to legislate morality from, from uh, Washington. Now, I'm a, I'm a bit of a student of the Founding Fathers and of our, of our history of our government and that kind of thing here in America. Uh, I can't say that I know that much about a lot of the other governments around the world. I just know a little bit here and there. But by and large, I have a better understanding of our own government. And when you go back to its founding principles, you go back to the Founding Fathers themselves, um, they were clearly building a, a, a society structured around uh, a Judeo-Christian morality and ethic. Now, you may not like that if you're watching this and you're not a Christian. You might think, well, that's not true. Well, I would challenge you to go back and read their writings. I'm not saying every single founding father was a born-again believer, but there's no question that even those who were nominal or even those who may have actually maybe would have been defined as deists still did hold to the idea of looking to the scriptures uh, as, as a foundation for establishing our country and our laws and our sense of governance and uh, some of the founding principles, the idea of us being endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these, not all of them, but among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Again, among others, there these are just three that are named. And so, the idea of God being at the at the, at the heart of our founding and all this kind of a thing makes perfect sense. And it's something that, as Christians, we should appreciate and embrace and try to defend. You know, we should stand up and speak when these things are challenged. That's a different thing from saying that we're going to, from Washington, legislate a morality that turns our culture into the kingdom of God so that Jesus can come back and rule and reign over it. Uh, that's different for a number of reasons. Number one, because that's not the way Jesus said, and the most important reason, the one I want to camp out on here for the rest of our time, pretty much, is that that's not the way that the Bible describes how the kingdom of God will come to earth. It won't be because we've established it. As a matter of fact, quite the contrary. Uh, as a matter of fact, that we're going to turn here again, as I mentioned a moment ago, to Daniel chapter 2 uh, in just a moment here. Um, but let me just mention, uh, as we're kind of turning there and making our way, that whereas I mentioned before that this movement is not something that is brand new by any means. It's been around for a while. It's, it's gone through various, uh, it's, it's been called various things, but typically speaking, the, the idea of kingdom dominion or, or dominion theology, these ideas, these titles, I should say, have kind of stuck. And so um, groups today, however, that uh, have moved into embracing this idea uh, tend to be charismatic churches. Uh, they tend to be groups that, um, that believe in uh, the idea of the power of God being demonstrated here and uh, through people in order that we might ultimately bring about his kingdom. Uh, kingdom Now is actually uh, the name of the Dominion Movement in many of the charismatic churches. And so um, I probably should mention too, in concert with that, one movement that, that is relatively, uh, relatively recent but has also picked up steam. Uh, it's not a denomination per se, but it's a movement within Christendom that is called the New Apostolic Reformation. Um, I'm trying not to jump all over the place, but I'm going to connect the dot here real quick. Um, because charismatic churches are embracing this idea, it's not hard to understand how a group like the New Apostolic Reformation, a group that seeks to restore the lost apostolic and prophetic authority of those who, uh, who formed the foundations of the church, as Paul would say in, in, uh, in Ephesians 4, uh, or Ephesians, uh, uh, yeah, Ephesians 4. And so um, it's not surprising how a group like that would find entrance into this kind of thinking uh, through charismatic lines. The idea being that if we, uh, if we have modern day apostles and prophets with apostolic authority and receiving prophetic words from God, if those offices are restored, then it becomes the time once again to uh, establish, uh, kind of reestablish the church and its rightful place in society. Ultimately, um, you know, again, in this idea of reconstructing and bringing about um, the kingdom of God. And so um, the New Apostolic Reformation um, 
with that, we'll, we'll, at some point we'll spend more time to, to speak to that. But I, I want to connect that with what's going on here because that is, again, a movement that's picked up some steam. And it's not in a vacuum. It's different than the Dominion Theology movement, but they are definitely uh, movements that coincide, uh, understandably. Um, there, there, is, uh, there are dangers to the idea of the New Apostolic Reformation and, and the ideas that they, uh, that they hold, um, the beliefs that they hold. Again, starting with the idea of apostolic authority, the idea that there are today, walking among us, those who claim to have the same apostolic authority as Peter or John or any of the disciples who walked with Jesus, those apostles, those twelve uh, that walked with him, the eleven after Judas, then Matthias joining, or, or Paul even for that matter. Um, there's a couple of problems with that. First off, there's no biblical uh, foundation to the idea of apostolic succession. There's nothing in Scripture that says that, that after Peter died, he was going to name a successor. After John died, he was going to name a successor. These guys all had people that followed them. They all had people that, that wanted to carry on the work that they were doing, that brought the words that they wrote and, and spoke of and, and, and propagated them, no doubt. But that's different than, than claiming that these people, like Polycarp with John or somebody like this, that Polycarp had apostolic authority. He didn't have apostolic authority. He had the benefit of being a disciple of John and sort of a link between John and then the patristics or the church fathers and the generations that followed because he was the one who knew John. But he didn't have the same authority. He wasn't handpicked by Jesus and then empowered as a foundation of the church like John would have been. Uh, or any of the disciples passing this on, the mantle as it were, like an Elijah to an Elisha or something. That's, there's no biblical precedent for this when it comes to the apostles. And so to make the claim that you have it is to reach from outside the scripture somewhere and just come up with this idea that you're one of those that has this. Secondly, and what follows naturally, most often because our human nature has fallen as it is, uh, is that we tend to, when, when someone claims to have that authority, uh, and others buy into that idea that this person has this authority, then that person becomes sort of an unquestioned, untouchable, uh, Lord's anointed kind of a person. Um, uh, you know, who are you to question uh, somebody with apostolic authority? Well, that, that's the thinking today, but that's certainly not biblical and first century thinking, but that tends to be our thinking today. Um, of course, we're supposed to question apostles. We've mentioned before in previous podcasts that you know, when Paul taught those in Berea, now the Bereans didn't just take what Paul said uh, without checking it against the scripture. And um, they're called more noble by the Holy Spirit in scripture in, in Acts chapter 17, verse 11. And, uh, and so the idea that, that someone with apostolic authority can't be questioned would be wrong. Um, uh, you know, even the idea of not touching the Lord's anointed. I mean, that, that doesn't speak of not criticizing the Lord's anointed or not judging whether someone who claims that authority um, is above question. Um, just as an aside, in 1 Samuel, where, um, where that expression is used, the idea of not touching the Lord's anointed, that concept, comes from when David had an opportunity to kill Saul, but didn't because Saul was the Lord's anointed. As disobedient, as renegade as he'd become, as off the rails as he'd become, I should say, he was still the Lord's anointed in David's eyes. And so David said, who am I to touch the Lord's anointed? But then he went on to criticize the Lord's anointed and talk about how he was off the rails and he was chasing David down, even though David had done nothing but serve him and everything. And so he didn't strike the Lord's anointed or kill him. That's what touch meant in that context where it's used. But secondly, David criticized. He called him out. He completely rebuked the Lord's anointed. So somebody who claims to have apostolic authority is not any better than you or I as the average believer. As a matter of fact, they are mistaken in thinking they have that authority. They don't. There's no biblical precedent for this whatsoever. And so to claim it for yourself is, is, is wrong and frankly, maybe even pretty arrogant. And so um, the movement as a whole is built, built on a flawed premise. But getting back to our original point is that it, it's not hard to see how those who claim to have apostolic authority or prophetic authority uh, would, would find a place in a movement that is seeking to restore the kingdom of God on earth so that Jesus can then return. Now, let's talk about um, what the Bible does say about the kingdom of God eventually coming. Uh, and I do believe we're getting soon, uh, to, to that time soon. I think the rapture is around the corner. I think we are going to be snatched away to be with the Lord, as Paul writes about to the Thessalonians. 
I think that time is coming very, very soon. And then, of course, thereafter, shortly thereafter, uh, there will be um, there will be those uh, there will be the return of of Christ's kingdom to the earth for all to see. Well, surprisingly, um, we find out a little bit about this idea not only from the New Testament, but even from the Old Testament. Now, again, I mentioned that we want to look at uh, look at the book of Daniel here in chapter two, and I'm going to read verses 31 to 45. Now, the context here is that Nebuchadnezzar has had a dream. Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, uh, have been uh, taken captive to Babylon. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar has has struck uh, Israel, Jerusalem, and, and Daniel and his friends are taken into captivity. And uh, and Daniel, under you know God's providence, brings uh, is, is brought up to a place of uh, through this episode is brought through to a place of prominence. In Nebuchadnezzar's court. Well, this is the episode here that finally gets him the recognition. And so Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and uh, and he calls his sorcerers and magicians to come and to, um, to explain uh, what this uh, dream is. But here's the catch. He's not going to tell them what the dream was. And so they have to tell him both the dream and what it means. And so, of course, you know, it's one thing for these guys to sort of be told what the dream is and then to come up with some interpretation interpretation that just kind of flies in Nebuchadnezzar's mind, but Nebuchadnezzar's kind of testing these guys to see if they're really uh, the real deal. And so they come back and they say, well, we can't tell you what your dream was. Who can do that? You know? And so Nebuchadnezzar puts them aside and Daniel's name comes up. And uh, Daniel has an audience with Nebuchadnezzar. And here is what Daniel says when given the opportunity to explain to Nebuchadnezzar what this dream both is and what it means. In verse 31, Daniel says, You saw, O king, and behold a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone, was cut, uh, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them into pieces. And then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like chaff of, summer, of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell, you the king, uh, tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them, uh, rule over them all. You are the head of gold, and another kingdom inferior to you shall rise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because, of, uh, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things, and like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush these things. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of the potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be divided kingdom, but some of the uh, firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with the soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to other people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut without uh, from a, uh, that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain. And its interpretation, sure. Now, naturally, Nebuchadnezzar is pretty blown away by this. Not only is Daniel given an interpretation, but he's even said what the dream was. And so this dude's legit. So um, Daniel explains that the image that Nebuchadnezzar sees represents uh, the different metals that comprise this image represent different kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar's being the first, the, the gold. His would be followed by the Persians, then by the Greeks, and then ultimately uh, uh, the Medes and Persians, then by the Greeks, and then uh, by the Romans. And then at the very end, there is this sort of mixture of a partially Roman Empire, but mixed with something else. We understand this ultimately becomes uh, 
kind of a revived Roman Empire in the last days where it's not purely like the old Rome per se, but it's like it, it's similar to it in some ways. That's another study which we've talked a little bit about in the past. But here's the thing, and it, it, uh, this is why I brought this passage out. These kingdoms of succeeding, uh, just one that succeeds the other, ultimately down to the feet, the kingdom that finally comes and destroys them and, and ultimately fills the earth like a, a mountain filling the earth is a kingdom that is not put together by people. It's not touched by human hands. It is something completely other that comes in and strikes down those kingdoms of the earth and ultimately that last kingdom. But by extension, what is being said here is that all of the kingdoms that ever come and go are nothing compared to the kingdom that is to come. And this kingdom will come not by human effort or by any human part at all, but it'll come uh, from the God of heaven. He will establish his kingdom and there will be no end. And there is a huge distinction made between this kingdom and all of the other kingdoms. Glorious and, and kind of shrinking glory as they are as these metals ultimately digress into to, you know, to iron and then clay and such. But this mountain that comes, a stone cut without hands, it just comes and strikes down and it's, it's established and there's not even a remnant of any of these other kingdoms. It just completely blows away like chaff. Well, that gives us a picture of how God is going to establish his kingdom when it's time. This speaks of that kingdom that we see happening in Revelation 19, 20, 21, uh, where Jesus comes and, and as he strikes down the enemy, which by the way is another thing. In Revelation 19, when Jesus returns, uh, you know, there, there is this satanic rebellion where he gathers up the nations to go to war against the Lord. Well, that doesn't sound like we've established a Christianized world. There's no, it doesn't sound like we've reconstructed anything. It sounds like the world has gone completely downhill. It's under the power of the Antichrist, who's empowered by Satan, and everybody's ganging up trying to put Jesus down. But Jesus, uh, as Paul would say in, in his writings of Thessalonians, by the brightness of his power in Revelation 19, like the, the sword proceeding out of his mouth, the truth, the word of God just being spoken by him, he puts down the enemies, casts the enemy, uh, uh, the, 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 the Antichrist, the false prophet, into the, uh, into the lake of fire and all of these things. And then he establishes his kingdom. Nowhere do you get any sense whatsoever that this has anything to do with the church setting anything up for this. Matter of fact, if we understand Revelation correctly, I think, in, 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 uh, in my humble opinion, IMHO, that in, by the time we get to Revelation chapter 4, the church is gone. And so God is now working through Israel, and ultimately Jesus comes to fulfill his promise to Israel. The saints who are believers, the church, comes back with him, and ultimately he sets up his millennial kingdom. Now. None of those things sound like we're restoring, restructuring, reconstructing anything. This is entirely a work of the Lord. And so we need to look to the scripture when we consider ideas like kingdom now or people claiming apostolic authority to bring the kingdom of God about and things like this. The Bible does not paint a pretty picture of the world when Jesus comes back. As a matter of fact, Jesus asks questions like, will the Son of Man find faith on the earth when he returns? Uh, you know, the idea is that the world is going to continue to sink further and further into rebellion against God until it becomes time for that age of grace to come to an end and God ultimately brings judgment upon the world. And then finally, the great white throne judgment at the end of the millennial kingdom after Satan is released for a time and final judgment happens. And so, um, why spend time talking about this stuff? Well, because I said at the beginning, theology matters. Um, there are implications for adopting flawed ideas biblically, uh, of having misunderstandings that are not rooted in scripture about how God is going to do things. Uh, theology matters. You know, we mentioned uh, before about the idea of, of those claiming to have apostolic authority becoming those that suddenly the church has to submit to because they're apostles after all. Who are we to question? Uh, what about prophets who claim to have a word from the Lord? Well, the scripture is God's word and the canon is closed. And so if you're going to claim to be getting some new revelation that is somehow doctrinal uh, or some word to the body of Christ as a whole, that's kind of dangerous territory. I do believe God can give a word. Um, but you'll notice that the scriptures, and we spend time talking about this when we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if you want to go back and listen to that. But if God gives a word 
it becomes the role and responsibility of those believers who hear that word to scrutinize it, to judge it, to make sure it's in fact lining up with what God has already said. In other words, if someone claims to have a new word, it needs to fit through the grid of what God has already said. He's given us his word as a God by which to judge things that are being said and claimed to be his word today. Um, you know, entire movements have started based on claims to new revelation. The Book of Mormon or things like this are one example of where there's uh, been a claim to new revelation that somehow is a continuation of God's revelation of his word and, 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 and by virtue of that has, in that movement's eyes, superseded the word of God. Um, and so, uh, and by the way, if you are a Mormon out there watching this and you take issue with that statement, the idea of the Book of Mormon superseding the word of God and not simply being a continuation of it, in other words, the idea that there's no contradiction between the two, I would really encourage you to reach out to me so we can discuss that. Um, there are clearly contradictions between the two. And then we have to ask the question, what do we base our authority on? What do we base our understanding of truth on? Well, that applies here when we talk about um, Reconstructionism or we talk about Kingdom Dominion Theology or the New Apostolic Reformation. The Word of God is king. The, at the end of the day, the Word of God determines uh, what is right and what is wrong when someone claims to be speaking on behalf of God or claims uh, authority given uh, like the apostles would have had and that kind of a thing. Uh, one, one other thing I'll mention here before we come to a close is that um, this movement also basically, for the most part, I guess I don't know if every single adherent does, but in general these movements, uh, uh, this the movement of dominion theology, uh, actually uh, takes, a, takes a, a view that the church has replaced Israel. Um, and, and that is a very dangerous theology. Um, it's not overstating it to say that it's that kind of thinking where the church has replaced Israel uh, that certainly uh, contributed to the Holocaust. The idea that, you know, since the Jews killed the Messiah and everything, they forfeited everything, and so therefore they're not God's people anymore, and therefore we can reject them. Well, God has said that, you know, if you, uh, you know, you strike at Israel, you're striking against the apple of his eye, and that never changed. And so a movement that tends to set Israel aside and, and think that the church is, is sort of the new Israel is mistaken with some pretty harrowing consequences in history and certainly uh, could potentially bring some pretty ugly consequences in the days to come as well. Uh, you don't want to be on the wrong side of that equation. You know, when God told Abraham that he'll bless those that bless him and curse those that curse him, I want to be on the right side of that. And so, um, um, so, so a movement that takes the opposite view on that is kind of a strange place to be. Um, so, uh, you know, and there are other things too, but I think that's enough to start with. Again, my hope in these podcasts is always just to stir up enough thought and enough interest to dive into these things. And again, movements like the, the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation, um, uh, Kingdom Dominion, Kingdom Now, Dominionism, these things, they're very easy to find information online. And I would encourage you to be a student of your own as well um, and, uh, and, and to take some time to understand those things. Because chances are that in your experience as a believer, you will meet somebody who has uh, one of these views. It's not uncommon at all for people to embrace these ideas. There are entire denominations in the body of Christ that adopt ideas like this. And so you want to think about them. You want to consider what the scriptures say. Um, and on this last thought, uh, I'll, I'll kind of connect this uh, idea that you want to apply yourself as a believer to a well-rounded, full view of what the scriptures teach. Um, there is a plan of God that literally goes from the very beginning all the way through. And it all points ultimately to Christ. But the plan of God as it unfolds, as relates to Christ being the, uh, you know, the spirit of Christ is the, uh, you know, is, is, is the spirit of prophecy, right? The idea that these things ultimately point to him, these things draw us to him. Well, all the plans and purposes of God that unfold in the days to come, ultimately, he's, he's the linchpin of these things. And so when we read these things and we understand them in their context, we learn a lot about Jesus himself. We learn a lot about the things that he's doing and going to do. Uh, and when we do that, we tend to kind of move away from some of these movements we've been talking about today because we start to understand. And for the life of me, I'm not sure how it is that some, that some very sincere people don't see that in these movements. Uh, and my heart breaks for them, really. My, my hope is not to be super critical of people individually, but to consider these movements and to shine the light of scripture on them a little bit and, and cause people to maybe think a little bit more about uh, 
where their allegiances lie, theologically speaking. And so, um, so I guess all that said, um, let me go ahead and pray. And again, I hope that's some food for thought, and uh, we'll continue to, to, to speak on these things in the days ahead. Certainly, as we look at prophecy and things like this, ideas like this uh, are important to consider uh, as we look at the last days. And, uh, you know, when Jesus uh, said, you know, one of the last days would be characterized by false prophets and things like this. And so it's important for us to consider who we listen to, what they say, in the light of what God has already said. So let's commend ourselves to that. Father, we thank you so much for your truth. We thank you for the word of God by which we can know with confidence that we can stand and we uh, can, can judge things through it, whether things are true or not, whether prophecies or prophets are legit or not. Father, we uh, thank you that uh, you've given us the scripture as this guide. And we pray that, Father, where the scripture is silent, we wouldn't interject our own doctrines and theologies, but rather we would stop where the scriptures do on these ideas and simply trust that you have told us what we need. And so, um, uh, so Father, I pray for those that are kind of wrapped up in movements like this and the damage that sometimes can come about as a result of these, uh, these misguided beliefs. And I just pray that sincere believers in these movements would recognize the error of these things and move out of them and instead embrace a, a much more well-rounded theology looking at the scriptures and not just hearing what someone claiming authority tells them. Um, so, Father, we commit ourselves to you and to your truth and pray that by your Holy Spirit uh, we would exercise good, solid biblical discernment in these things. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we look forward to seeing your kingdom come and we uh, ask that your will would be done in, 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 in knowable ways even now, but we pray that you would do that, Father. And we do want to pray for the day when Jesus comes and ultimately sets right all the wrongs and sets everything in order just as you said you will. So thank you, Father. We praise you and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, and by the way, before I sign off here, uh, if you have any questions or comments, as always, you can uh, comment on our YouTube channel if you're watching there. If you go to our, uh, our church's website, you can reach out to me personally through there at calvarychapelfranklin.com, or you can go to my own personal website at parsonspad.com, and you can comment on the videos there. You can email me through there as well. Uh, as always, I really enjoy the interactions, and certainly I, I, I love that, that, uh, that, that these can be a helpful uh, extra tool in your, uh, in your toolbox as you learn the Word of God. I'm thankful to come alongside of you as we study the Word together. So thank you for watching, thank you for interacting, and God bless you as you get to know Him better through His Word.